Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Hinkley Point setback as European Commission criticises strike price deal with EDF. Internal EU trade barriers hold UK companies back. We must demolish them. Firms face EU blacklist in bribery law change. EU court advised to rule against payment card fees. Plus, European Union Commission to investigate cross-border pay TV movie services, a new Murphy's Law. Well, happy Valentine's Day. It's Friday the 14th of February. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First up from our homepage, Hinkley Point setback as European Commission criticises strike price deal with EDF. The £16 billion future of a new nuclear power station at Hinkley Point in Somerset was thrown into doubt last night after the European Commission published a damning report into the deal between the government and EDF. The EC Competition Commissioner, Joaquin Alumnia, sent a letter to Westminster saying the government should not be handing over such huge subsidies to the French energy firm to ensure the power station gets built and supplies energy for decades to come. Last night, local MP Ian Little Granger accused senior Alumnia of talking twaddle and said it was clear the European Union wanted to scupper the British energy strategy and see the light go out in this country. Now, the article continues through the details of the Hinkley Point C reactor. But as you know, we've been following this story for a while. So let's just reiterate some of the numbers. The plan is for French company EDF and Chinese investors to build the power station and sell its output at double cost price. The plant would generate £77 billion over its lifespan, all of which would of course belong to the shareholders. Now, the UK government is prohibited from getting involved because of EU state aid laws. And now it seems that the EU is also going to stifle the development. Now, notice the common denominator here, the European Union. And as you can see, our parliament and politicians are powerless to do anything. The control all resides with the EU in Brussels. So, first question. If our membership of the EU is simply as a trading marketplace, then what has this got to do with the EU? The second question, why is the UK government not building this with UK taxpayers' money? From its £16 billion investment, it would generate £77 billion, providing return on tax invested, a GDP boost and solving our power requirements in one foul swoop. Finally, just to put the cat amongst the pigeons with our readers with an economic interest, the government would say it has no money for such a project. There is growing interest, however, in a non-bank issued currency, issued as credit from the Treasury against future tax receipts. Now, this has been done before, in the early 1900s. It was called the Bradbury Pound. Of course, you can forget all about this lot, whilst we have handed government control to the EU in Brussels. Internal EU trade barriers hold UK companies back. We must demolish them. Scepticism about the EU is not born out of nationalism, but from practical experiences that show Britain has invested far more into the EU than it gets out. In particular, opportunities to maximise the economic benefits of EU membership have been missed. Brussels' focus on deepening political and social union has undermined the advantages of the single market and prevented its completion. A serious debate about the UK's role in the EU is therefore pressing, and whether Britain remains a member or not, our relationship needs to evolve over the next decade. In the services sector, where the UK performs particularly strongly, barriers to trade are acting as a serious economic drag. It seems an obvious point, but since 2000, EU services have added significantly more value than manufacturing and created far more new jobs. An estimated 71% of total EU GDP comes from services, yet trade liberalisation is far more developed for goods. Services account for just 22% of trade within the EU. 
the implementation of the European Commission's services directives has been worryingly incomplete as member states persist with a patchwork of national regulation. Now this holds back not just UK services companies, but the wider EU economy. It's been estimated that further services liberalisation could lead to an increase in EU GDP of between 1.8% and 2.3%. The single market should have been completed in the 1990s, but two decades of additional services-driven wealth creation have been lost. We can buy and sell online at the click of a mouse, yet only 11% of individuals engage in cross-border shopping, according to Open Europe. Removing prescriptive rules, such as when sales promotions can be offered, would boost trade in this area. Now, one needs to bear in mind, of course, that liberalisation must be the new... Um, one must bear in mind, of course, that liberalisation must be the new privatisation, or this year's black, so to speak. But the UK needs a political mindset that has greater sense of economic balance, increases in primary and secondary industries. Of course, the UK is currently greatly outcompeted by offshore labour charges. But we are world class in software, systems, engineering and robotics. Internal programmes to develop and ignite research and development through our university toward developing automation in mining, farming, production and distribution could change that balance in the UK's favour. Firms face EU blacklist in bribery law change. Companies and banks that fail to prevent financial crime by their staff could face vast fines and be blacklisted from European contracts under a change to the Bribery Act being considered by the government. A proposed amendment put forward by David Green, head of the Serious Fraud Office, would give Britain's fraud-busting agency wider powers to take direct action against corporates, enabling it to levy US-style fines and branding them with the stigma of abetting bribery. Now, any such move by the under-fire SFO would be controversial because a bribery conviction would bar companies from bidding for certain contracts under European Union rules. Now, the mooted change to the Bribery Act, which came into force in July 2011, would have significant ramifications for the banks embroiled in the serious fraud office investigations into the alleged rigging of LIBOR. Now, the proposed changes have been discussed with Dominic Grieve, the Attorney General, and Oliver Heald, the Solicitor General, as well as the Law Commission, the statutory body that recommends law reform. Under the Bribery Act, it is an offence for a company to fail to prevent acts of bribery by its staff, but prosecutors must show that the controlling mind of the company, its board, knew about the activity. Now that is a far higher test than the one under US law, with most evidence, such as email trails, petering out before it gets to board level. The SFO's poor success rate in corporate prosecutions compared to US counterparts is a major source of frustration for a UK agency trying to rebuild its reputation after some high-profile blunders. Now, speaking to The Telegraph, Mr Green said, I recognise we'll never get the principle of controlling mind easily changed in this country, but what I have been proposing is that Section 7 of the Bribery Act could very usefully be expanded by a very small amendment. At the moment, it is an offence for a corporate to fail to prevent bribery by its employees with a statutory defence of adequate procedures. Now, I have proposed expanding that to a corporate failing to prevent acts of financial crime by its employees. All sounds reasonable until you consider the implications for businesses. The burden of responsibility upon a company for and to its employees is already vast and expensive. And also there is the risk in this amendment to the law that the employees are in some sense responsible for the commitment of such acts. EU court advised to rule against payment cards fees. A top legal official in the European Court of Justice advised the EU judges to reject an appeal made by MasterCard over the fees it charges on payment transactions. The fees, best known by their acronym MIFs, or Multilateral Interchange Fees, have been the object of a legal dispute between the EU authorities and the major payment cards companies, MasterCard and Visa. 
Now, yesterday's opinion, given by the Advocate General of the ECG, Paolo Mengozi, is the latest episode of a saga that has run since 2007 and is expected to end by autumn at the latest. The court is to issue its definitive decision between April and September 2014. No big surprise is expected. Over the years, the EU institutions have shown a common front against MIFs accused of being a hidden tax on consumption by Neely Crows. The EU Antitrust Commissioner, who started the fight more than six years ago before passing the baton to the current Competition Commissioner, Joaquina Munia. Mastercard has hit back at the Commission, but its legal recourse was rejected by the EU Tribunal in 2012. The payment card group has issued a second appeal against the Tribunal. EU Commission to investigate cross-border pay TV movie services, a new Murphy's Law. The European Commission has commenced antitrust proceedings against several prominent European pay TV service providers and major US film studios, including Sony Pictures Entertainment, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers and Paramount Pictures. The investigation will hinge on whether prior case law restricting the grant of absolute territorial protection in respect of sports broadcasting can be extended to apply to movie licensing for personal use via satellite broadcasting and online streaming. The Commission will consider in particular whether such provisions prevent broadcasters and online providers from providing services across borders, for example by requiring them to accept potential subscribers from other member states to block cross-border online access to content or to prevent subscribers from viewing content on mobile devices whilst abroad. Arguably, the investigation may not have as wide an impact as might first appear likely, at least in respect of satellite broadcasting. Currently, it is common for consumers within the EU who are living abroad to buy decoders to watch programmes broadcast on pay TV services from their home country. Broadcasters are aware of such passive sales but tend not to enforce the restrictions in subscription contracts against such consumers. Now, while it appears that the Commission wants to bring movie licensing in line with the licensing of football broadcasting rights by removing absolute territorial restrictions, it may take many months or even years for the Commission to issue a decision. Well, today in our video library, now, not directly in our own video library today, but I want to link to suspiciousobservers.org. Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers has done such a tremendous job of putting together really well-balanced and easily understood information about the ideas around climate change. Now, the objective is not to debunk the idea of anthropogenic climate change, i.e. global warming as a direct cause of human activity, but to look more deeply into the topic and ask the question, does the evidence support the hypothesis? It's clear to anyone that the climate is changing, and long-term records show this with undeniable clarity. But does our terrestrial understanding of weather really paint a clear picture? Today, we're linking to episode 4 of Climate, but for new watchers, I highly recommend watching the full series. I'm Rick Miss, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon.